This is Important Stuff for you to know. Welcome to the show. This is Tony. And this is Javier. This is the show where we talk about what we believe may be important stuff. But in the end, it's for you to decide. Javier, today I'd like us to talk about an aspect of voter registration that I think is important stuff. Why, when you register to vote, must you declare a party affiliation, Democrat, Republican, or Independent? I, this has been concerning me. What do you think? Where in, in the U.S. Constitution does it say that for you to be allowed to vote, you have to declare your party affiliation? Wow. Do you want me to to quote the exact line and which paragraph and which page? No, I'm being silly. I'm being silly. Doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. I don't know when it came to this that you need to, it's your responsibility as a citizen of the United States to step forward, register, and provide and execute your vote. I don't know where it came to that you must declare Democrat, Republican, or independent. Why do you think we've come to this point? Well, I may have I may have two explanations. One could be that some social groups would like to be uh, uh, known how big they are, how powerful they are in numbers in this nation. For example, maybe the Hispanic uh, community. Uh, in the U.S. would like to let people know that they are, I don't know, maybe 20% of the population. So to let people know that they are a big, uh, powerful group that has influence in, uh, in uh, for example, in the political system. Uh, same with, uh, with African Americans and so on. That is one of them, that they, uh, through the uh, vote registration, uh, that information, I believe, is public. Uh, and it's accessible to many organizations. They can publish that, and people would know uh, how many Latinos and how many African Americans and uh, are in the U.S. So that is that's one explanation. I I agree with you completely. But aren't we moving into the territory of profiling? Doesn't this profile populations? And who has that authority to profile parts of the pop population? This leads to my second explanation. Well, there's no authority. I mean, th this is what this is what uh, the government is doing, probably uh, responding to some uh, interest, uh, lobbyists and so on, that want to know exactly those numbers. Now, what about the parties? Uh, what if the parties want to know that? Because that way they can target their political campaigns and messages uh, towards specific uh, ethnic groups uh, in, in the U.S. I, I think that's exactly why a declared registration, Democrat, Republican, Independent, takes place, so that they can target. Targeting is a dangerous word because it is true profiling. And again, I come back to who takes the authority to target populations and for what purpose? We talked before about corporations targeting in their marketing. Are they profiling? Well, in a way, I mean, they're taking advantage of that information. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know how much influence they've had in uh, in uh, requesting that people identify their political affiliation, but they take advantage of those numbers being available because when they plan their, their marketing campaigns and sales campaigns, uh, they can, again, target specific ethnic groups, uh, uh, which uh, you, is, is the better way to invest their advertising and marketing dollars. Well, agreed. Yeah, there's a scientific element to it. So I guess we can conclude that in some ways profiling can be good for business, but in some ways it can be bad. I, I think it's dangerous. I think it's dangerous if we are talking about uh, declaring your voter registration versus 
marketing campaigns by companies. If we're equating those as the same, I'm not sure we should. I have I have a a uh, an example that it's it's very current uh, in uh, in Venezuela, the country where I'm from, uh, where they have they profile. And they get so much information from the uh, from each election that they actually have lists of people who have voted against the government, and they have taken revenge against them. So again, this is a very, very, very dangerous terrain to get into. I I couldn't agree more. I think we need to pursue this topic more. This is important stuff. And on that note, we'll be back in, after a short. Break. Welcome back. Tony, I have another issue that I would like to talk with you about. Okay, It's this issue that has been on the news uh, recently about the uh, U.S. government requesting uh, records of, of a lot of people uh, from the phone carriers. And apparently now it has come out that also from their activities on the Internet. Now, uh, what do you think about this? Is this important stuff? I think it is. Well, what? What do you think? Yeah, absolutely, I agree with you. It's important stuff, and it's all over the news. Let me just back up one second. My understanding, at this point, what we know, and it may come out to be much more extensive, is the government reached a sweep of Verizon, specifically Verizon, records of many, many of their customers to gain specific data, information on phone calls. Uh, to At this point, I, I don't know if there are any conversations involved in that or it's extended out to other social uh, uh, companies, but this is very important and should concern a lot of citizens. But I could see this from the start. This is something that has been rolling in your mind. What specifically is concerning you here? What are your specifics on this? Let's define it. Yeah, okay. I'm going to share with you some issues that, you know, I've been thinking uh, all along this, this morning after I, I read the news and I heard the news also on the TV. I think it has several implications and let's hope we can address a few of them you know, maybe not all of them because of time but one of them is you know this is what it's called you know some people think this is government overreaching okay going too far searching for information for private information and if you go back into the recent history of the u.s we have we have a situation where during the second world war everybody that was of japanese origin or perceived to be of Japanese origin was in turn in a, uh, uh, let's say, holding uh, camp or holding center or holding center during the war. Okay. And even up to today, governments, uh, um, U.S. government have been apologizing for the mistake that they made because it was profiling. And the reason why this is an issue to me is that it also in the news, I mean, there's, there are no facts, that at least, that are have been made available publicly. Just what they say is that 51% of those who were searched or whose records and files were searched and Internet activity were foreigners. So is this, do you think that this is a sort of profiling? Well, yeah, that's definitely profiling when you go in. But maybe we should define foreigners here. When they use the term foreigners, that's telling me uh, these are people outside the country. I don't know that that's the only category. Is it also including tourists and visitors to the country? Well, Let's this, clarify that. Well, this is where I'm concerned. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, am I a foreigner? Yes. Uh, you're an American. Uh, you were born in the U.S., but you come from a, from a European uh, background, yes. family. Okay? Yes. Right. So, 
but to me you're an American. Yes. Right? Okay. Now, what is a foreigner? For example, if we look at, at, at people coming in and out of the U.S., you, you can have people who are not U.S. citizens or residents or legal immigrants who are traveling, going through the U.S. in transit. So you could have some people who are in the U.S. soil at one point in time, mm -hmm. but are not U.S. citizens. They are foreigners, right? Got it. I'm following you. Okay. You could have tourists, people who are visiting the U.S. legally, temporarily. Okay. So that's another category. Then we can have people who are planning or are already living in the U.S. for long periods of time who are planning to stay either legally, which would be illegal immigrants, or you have illegally, which are illegal or undocumented immigrants. Then you have, for example, students who are yeah. with, a, with, a, with a student visa are here in, in schools and universities. That's five. Then you have people who are holding green cards, who are residents, legal residents in the U.S., who can stay here practically forever with a green card, who are, as I said, residents. Mm -hmm. So foreigners have so many connotations, so many of them, that, that that is what I say, what do they mean by foreigners? Well, here's what concerns me also. That's a good point on the foreigners. Um, that certainly is profiling and targeting, if that's the case. And it may well prove to be the case. But here's a point of law. Under the Constitution of the United States, any person standing on U.S. soil, regardless of their status, whether they are a resident, a visitor, a tourist, even undocumented person, uh, including also American citizens, fall under the same protection of the Fourth Amendment of the Bill of Rights. So due process under the law. So if 51% were set apart as foreigners, that certainly is profiling because uh, they have the same protection as all the American citizens. We're talking about over a hundred million people. I don't think these were all foreigners. Well, they said 51%. But now you see where I'm going to. And I'm glad that you mentioned that about the Fourth Amendment and the right that every individual has while on the U.S. soil to do process of law. If you remember the shoe bomber that was, yes. that was flying from London to, I believe, New York, uh, or somewhere in the U.S. Yes, okay, or yeah. L.A., I think it was L.A. Yeah. Okay, he was fine. And uh, he, he had a bomb in his, in his tennis shoes. And when you know the whole story, the government said that he had the right to be tried on a, in a U.S. court, in the, in the U.S. court system, because he had that right. Okay? I think he was a foreigner. He was, yes. uh, okay, and for some reason they say that he should not be tried as a war criminal or as a terrorist, that he should be tried on a U.S. court, as civil court or criminal court. Not as a terrorist or not as a criminal, but, uh, okay. My question is, isn't this a double standard? Because to this, that person, you are granting a constitutional right to be tried on a court with due process. Mm -hmm. But in this case, 50 million people, 51 million people, just because they're foreigners, did not have the right of privacy uh, under the Constitution. Why one person did at one point in time yes. and not these 51 million people? Well, okay, the, the, the 51% is certainly a concern because they do have rights under the Constitution of the United States. And equally as bad are the other uh, 49 percent, which apparently were American citizens. Now, uh, I think the gentleman's name was Richard Reed, the shoe bomber that came through, if, if my memory serves me correctly. But that was a case of a philosophical judgment, philosophical interpretation of the law. This 
was actually we are under a uh, a war on terror in an environment. So a person who is trying to affect terrorism against the United States is an enemy combatant. An enemy combatant can fall under a different category under the rules of war and can be tried in a military court as an enemy combatant. A philosophical decision was made that we will give him full protection under the laws of the U.S. Constitution so that he can be tried in a standard U.S. court judicial system. Either one, either one can be applied, but it is a philosophical difference and maybe a dangerous precedent. But the, the larger, larger point to this, that was one person. The, this is in excess of 100 million people Foreigners that are visiting, whatever their status is, 50, 60 million American citizens. Whatever. This is a sweeping capture of data that the U.S. government does not own the right. Even to capture, under the Constitution, they do not own the right to, to pull citizens of the United States without the authority of a check and balance, the judicial, they have to go after a court order. So that brings us to a whole different level of the law. Well, I'm, gl I'm glad you clarified that it's not, it's not only the 51% that I was thinking about, you know, the foreigners who were included in the search, but also it, because it's everybody. Actually, it's everybody, like yeah. you say. Yes. Everybody. The other 49% mm -hmm. who are apparently... Americans, they were also uh, victims of victims, quote unquote, maybe of, yes. of uh, illegal uh, search, yes, seizure or whatever. Okay, the next implication, uh, the, the 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 other concern that I have is the following. It looks like the justification for these activities are. The concern, or is the concern that the U.S. government has on on terrorist activities, and they want to prevent another 9/11 or Boston Marathon uh, bombing, bombing, or, or whatever. Okay, so because of that, they say we have to do this to to prevent and to find people before they commit these horrible crimes of terror. Now. Where do they draw the line? And number one, where do they decide that this is an act of terror? How do you define the limits of what could be suspicious activities leading to terror? And two, who makes that decision? Because it has, it is a subjective decision in the end. Mm -hmm. Somebody says, yes, Mr. So-and-so or Mr. Javier Enrique. Yes. It's, uh, it's involved in, uh, in uh, terrorist activities. This is the concerning part. Nobody has that authority to do that. No one person, whether they are the head of a government or an agency within the government. This is why we have the checks and balances and the protection under the Bill of Rights. I don't think there's anyone in the United States, citizens, visitors, foreigners, whatever the status, that would disagree that agencies of the U.S. government, in order to protect our rights, pro maintain our security, and to avoid terrorist acts against our country, in the performance of their, their uh, responsibilities, they uncover suspicion suspicious activity. They pursue it a little further, and they get to a point where they say, we need to investigate this. We need on this specific person, this specific group, this specific organization. This is the justification of what we have discovered, where we think it's going, and why. They cannot act on that. They have to go before a court to obtain a warrant under that justification to affect 
an investigation. I don't think there are any citizens in the United States that would disagree with some measure of that. But where does it go? That line has faded away. It's become sweeping. Don't you see that as the big well, problem? Well, if, if you, and if you go back probably in, in, in your family history, you know why they came to the U.S. from Europe? Uh, if you ask me why I came to the U.S., I've been here now continuously for uh, 13 years, and I went to college here, and I went to high school here also uh, as a foreign student. I came here because, number one, you know, this is probably or has historically, historically been for a long time a very secure place to live, the U.S., okay? has been a place where you could, you know, reach the American dream, you know, get a job, make money, have a house, uh, raise a family, have your children, probably go to uh, have better education than the one that you had. Uh, and also where you, there are rights that you enjoy and that you have and privileges that you hardly find anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So you say, here I am protected by the law. Here we have separation of powers in the government. There, there are count, there are uh, uh, counterbalances. You have the, the legislative, the judicial, and the uh, executive. executive. Mm -hmm. So you say, well, they can, you know, the, you, there's a balance among between them. You cannot, in, you you cannot go astray. One one of the arms of government cannot go astray because the other two would hold hold it back. Yes. So this means, you know, politically and economically and socially. And also for safety reasons, you know, that, that we think there's no better place to live. My concern is that what this is happening now could undermine this structure, the whole structure that made this nation great. And this is why when I read, you know, and I've been reading and hearing the news in the la last week or so, that is, it's it's troubling me, you know. Where, where is this going to stop? Are we talking about 1984, the Orwellian War? I mean, world. Are we talking about Big Brother is watching you? That now they know who I call, who calls me, what I do on the internet. Who, you know, which mails do I send? Which page pages do I visit? If this is true, what I'm reading in the news. I I, I have I I think you have every right to be concerned because this is certainly overreach. It's a dangerous direction, certainly a dangerous precedent. It's been going on for a while, and uh, not just the current administration, but it's reached back. Its origin was in the previous administration with restrictions. Now it's come to overreach. The line is blurred. It's gone too far. More importantly, and I think this is where we can, we can kind of summarize and leave this. We both are concerned. More importantly, I think anyone listening out there should be very concerned and not only on their own, but tell somebody else. This needs to be a concern of many, many people in the United States. And pay attention to what's going on. Pay attention to those people that are protecting your rights and those that are overreaching the right and our protections under the Constitution. This is a serious situation, needs to be investigated further. And I think we can take this topic up again, and we'll follow it up with the news, because I think we're going to learn more. Do you think this is where it stops? Uh, well, I hope so, uh, and maybe some backtracking would be. What I would add to what you just said is that people should also be connected. I mean, they have to follow this news, what the developing of this uh, process, uh, what is going to happen, where is it going to end, and they have to be really connected. Okay, as you said, they have to really know what's going on, who to go to, who to ask, who to call, how to influence, uh, because this could get out of hand. I mean, this has to be, there has to be an end to this that is satisfactory to everybody. I believe that we want, everybody wants to live in a safe place, and I understand 
the security issues. I just hope that they don't transcend those issues, those concerns of security, and get into other issues that should not be treated uh, in like they're doing it now. Point taken. So, pay attention. Be informed. Be an informed voter. That's important. So, on that note, uh, we're going to break here for a commercial, and we'll be right back. Final question. Is this important stuff or not? I think it is, but ultimately, it's for you to decide. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Javier, this is a segment that we get a lot of feedback on or suggestions. This is important stuff. Or is it? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to let you decide. Around the world, around the country, we have a lot of warning labels. We have a lot of signs. Let me throw a few out on a pudding package. You know, everybody likes around the holiday, especially. Uh, you make up a uh, warm pudding and then you chill it and I think you're supposed to eat it after it's chilled. I'm not sure. But here's a caution label on a pudding box. Caution. Will be hot after heating. This sounds like important stuff. What do you think, Javier? I, I would say yes. I mean, to let, you know, let people know that after they cook it, it's going to be hot for a while. It doesn't say for how long, but... I guess what they're trying to tell you is that if it explodes, it is not an issue because there's no pudding. Okay, so you cannot <laughs> eat it. Now, if you eat it immediately after it's cooked, it's all going to be hot. So I, I would say yes, yes. I mean, that's important stuff. It is know. important yeah. stuff. Yes. Yes. Don't eat <laughs> explodable pudding. Yeah. Okay. I'll take that one. Okay. Here we go. This is a hot topic for many of our female listening audiences wow. out there. Uh, that they travel with their hair dryers, their blow dryers that they take everywhere. They use it's well, many hotels have them, I guess now. But a warning label on the side of a popular handheld hair dryer: warning: Do not use while taking a shower. Wow, that sounds like important stuff. It is. Yeah, I think it has two purposes. Okay, one, that if you try to dry your hair while you're showering, you know, the idea of, of drying your hair is not going to work because you dry it and you get it wet. That's one. And the second one is that probably they're warning you that you could get an electric shock if you try to do it in the shower. Now, is that important? Well... You have, we have to realize that sometimes kids, you know, girls are late for a party and they want to shorten the time that they spend washing and drying their hair. <laughs> and they may think that it, they can do it faster I know while in the shower. This. So, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, yeah, I could. So it, that is important yeah, stuff. It, in, when you consider speed and efficiency, right. being prepared, being ready on time, okay, I'll accept that. That is important stuff. Ah, Javier, here's one sent in by a, uh, a caller uh, suggested to us. You know, we were talking on a previous show about the uh, car specialists. They can diagnose any type of problem. So this is one that, I don't know, maybe they came up with. Maybe they generated here. Sounds like important stuff. The warning label on a fan belt box. A car fan belt. The warning says, before installing this fan belt, be sure you shut off the engine, as it may cause irreversible injury. Wow, that sounds like important stuff. Is it? When do you change a fan belt? Uh, when it breaks. Right. <laughs> Right, when it breaks. So what happens when it breaks? The fan is not turning, right? Right. Aha. I think so. I'm not a mechanic, but probably the fan is not turning because it turns because of the belt, right? Right. Okay, so if it belt, if, if the uh, belt breaks, then the fan is not turning. 
So the people try to put the belt, because they're in a rush in the road or whatever, or a mechanic, and uh, when he puts the belt, ah, you know, that belt, that fan turning could hurt your fingers, you know. So uh, I think it's a good warning. It makes sense, you know, let people know that don't try to change the fan belt with the engine on, you know. I, I'm not a, an expert mechanic, and I, I don't know the steps and instructions that you should take, but this... Well, I know if the belt is on, you have to loosen the fan okay and so that the belt becomes loose and then you can remove it and put in the new one mm -hmm. now if it if the fan is turning who is going to get the hands of the belt nobody nobody so by, by it is obvious that the, that the engine will be off but just to make sure okay well, what what tells me this is important stuff uh, irreversible injury I, I'm not a rocket scientist, but that sounds like important stuff. Yeah, and, so, and it probably hurts a lot. So yeah, I, I agree I, with you on yes, that one. Yes, Good call. Yeah, good one. Okay, Javier, this is one sent in from one of our listeners. You and I both remember back in the 60s and the 70s, you know, those days of hallucinogenic drugs Ooh. and everything, the black lights and body painting. And here's a warning label on one of those lava lamps. The colorful oh, the red lava ones, the lamps. Green ones. Uh -huh. Beautiful. The warning says, do not ingest. You don't suppose someone ate a lava lamp while they were on drugs? Well, it depends what they were taking in those days, you know. Uh, what type of, uh, you know, L, 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 LDS? LSD. Or? LSD. I never had one that. Uh, it was too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, maybe it depends on what state, you know, the, uh, the, the people were. Maybe somebody thought there was, uh, you know, something that looked nice to eat. Uh, uh, I would say yes, but I doubt that they would read the label in the conditions they might be. So, you really think someone ate a lava lamp? I have some friends that, or were, maybe I had some friends pretty wild, you know. Maybe they drank whatever the material is that causes the lava inside the lamp. I don't know. I, I guess people. Well, they would not eat the lamp. <laughs> okay, no, now it, I no, understand. It, no, they so would, do they, not ingest. It, do not ingest the lava. The lava. Okay. Yeah, not the lamp. I was confused for a moment. Yeah, it happens. Now, you know, it happens. You know? Now I know. Yeah, this so. is important stuff <laughs> is, because I was confused. <laughs> Okay, in this season, we've all had opportunities to work in our gardens, in the yard, in the planting season, working on the landscaping. All of our neighbors are doing it. And we put that mulch around. It gives it the trim and the color. It makes it look good. Here's a bag of pine bark mulch uh -huh. used in landscaping. The warning what? label. The warning label on the outside, this is important stuff, Javier. Is Listen it? carefully. The warning label says, for pine bark mulch, this bag contains forest products. Uh -huh. uh, I would say yes. You know, uh, mulch comes from, uh, from trees, right? And trees have insects. And uh, larva and, and a lot of things that uh, should not be inside the house. Yeah, I mean we pay not to have those things in the house. Now, could you imagine that somebody trying to put mulch to decorate their their bedroom? Wow, to make I could nice, see where that could uh, be a problem. Especially somebody... in the west, maybe from the west they want to make it look you know outdoors and tropical whatever. so they landscape the indoor indoors ah, ah, okay. and see, so now i understand i would say yeah, yeah. i would say okay. it's important this is that is important it stuff is. yes for sure well javier we've come to the end of the show we certainly had a good time and we hope our listeners did too maybe along the way someone even learned something and remember if you think something is important stuff let us know, and we will talk about it. So, until next time, hasta la vista. vista.